consumer credit. Bobby Rush of Illinois chairs the Commerce Subcommittee on Consumer Protection. We'll hear first from FTC Chairman John Leibowitz. This part of the hearing is an hour 45 minutes. Chairman, uh, Mr. Donovich, Ms. Schakowsky, members of the subcommittee, um, I'm John Leibowitz. Uh, I'm the chairman of the Federal Trade Commission, and I really do appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today uh, to discuss the FTC's role in protecting consumers uh, from predatory financial practices. Um, this is my first hearing, as several of you mentioned, and, and um, uh, let me just say this. You're our authorizing committee. We want to work with all of you. We will not be a successful agency unless we can, unless we can work together, and, and I hope that we will be doing that over the coming weeks and months. Commission's views are set forth in the written testimony, which was approved by a vote of the entire commission, uh, though my answers to your questions represent my own views. Mr. Chairman, during these times of difficulty for so many American consumers, the FTC is working hard. Whether Americans are trying to stave off foreclosure, lower their monthly mortgage payments, or deal with abusive debt collectors, the FTC is on the job enforcing the law, offering guidance, and in the process of issuing new regulations. The written testimony describes in great detail the Commission's enforcement, education, and policy tools, and how we've used those tools to protect and advocate for consumers of financial services. We've brought about 70 cases involving financial services since I came to the Commission four and a half years ago, and we've gotten $465 million in redress for consumers over the past 10 years alone, in this area alone. But let me highlight just a few recent cases. In the fall, Bear Stearns and its EMC subsidiary paid $28 million to settle Federal Trade Commission charges of illegal mortgage servicing practices. For example, they misrepresented the amounts consumers owed, they collected unauthorized fees, they made harassing and deceptive collection calls. In January, we sent out more than 86,000 redress checks, 86,000 to reimburse consumers who were harmed. And today, the FTC announced two more cases against so-called mortgage rescue operations that allegedly charged thousands of dollars in upfront fees but failed to provide any assistance in saving people's homes. Even worse, these scurrilous companies, Hope Now and New Hope, gave consumers false hope by impersonating the HUD-endorsed Hope Now Alliance, which helps borrowers, borrowers with free debt management and credit counseling services, mostly low-income consumers. I am pleased to report that the courts have issued temporary restraining orders stopping these fraudulent claims and freezing the company's assets. We're announcing a third action today against yet another rogue rescue scam. Less than two weeks ago, FTC investigators discovered a foreclosure rescue website that was impersonating the HUD website itself. The HUD Inspector General had the site taken down. Last week, however, uh, we were told that the same site had popped up again on a different ISP. Within hours, we filed a complaint against the unknown operators of the site, and armed with a court order, we shut it down. Let me assure you, particularly in this economic climate, the FTC will continue to target fraudulent mortgage rescue operations. But we can do better, and we will. Um, Mr. Chairman, you mentioned the lack of statutory authority, uh, the, hand, the one hand tied behind our back. First, we are going to vigorously enforce new mortgage rules issued by the Federal Reserve Board that go into effect this fall that will prohibit a variety of unfair, deceptive, and abusive mortgage uh, advertising, lending, appraisal, and servicing practices, such as banning subprime liars' loans. Second, the 2009 Omnibus Appropriations Act gave us authority to find violators in this area for the first time. And third, we're going to use the regulatory authority given to us by the Omnibus to issue new regulations that will protect consumers from other predatory mortgage practices. We expect these rules to address foreclosure rescue scams and unfair and deceptive mortgage modification and servicing practices. At the same time, we're going to focus more attention on empirical research about how to make mortgages and other disclosures more effective so that consumers have accurate, easily understandable information about a mortgage's terms. We've put a prototype uh, disclosure form on your desks. It is clearly better, and we've copy tested this, uh, th than what people are using under current law. But we could use more help. FTC law enforcement would be a greater deterrent if we were able to obtain civil penalties for all unfair and deceptive acts and practices related to financial services beyond mortgages. For example, in-house debt collection and debt negotiation. 
Um, the FTC could also do more to assist consumers if it could use streamlined um, APA rulemaking procedures to promulgate rules for unfair acts and practices related to financial services other than mortgage loans. These steps, of course, would require congressional action. They may perhaps require some more resources. Will all of these measures be enough? Well, they could certainly help to ensure that we're never in this kind of economic mess again. Finally, Mr. Chairman, as you know, right now jurisdiction is balkanized between the FTC and the banking agencies about who protects American consumers from deceptive financial practices. Several bills have been introduced uh, that call for an overall federal consumer re uh, protection regulator of financial services. As discussions about these proposals continue, we urge you to keep this in mind. The FTC, the Commission, has unparalleled expertise in consumer protection. That's what we do. We're not beholden to any providers of financial services, and we have substantial experience effectively and cooperating working with, uh, working with the states, effectively and cooperatively working with the states. In short, if your committee and if Congress determines that such an overall federal regulator is needed, if you do, we ask that the FTC be an integral part of the discussion about how to best protect the American public. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to speak today about what the FTC has done, what we're going to do. We look forward to working with this committee, and I'm pleased to answer your questions. Thank you. The Chair, thanks, the Chairman. Uh, the Chair recognizes himself for five minutes mm -hmm. for the purposes of questioning our witness. <clears throat> Uh, Chairman Libowitz, during the housing boom, the FTC had clear uh, jurisdiction over many of the worst predatory lenders with the most objectionable practices. But the commissioner arguably didn't do much to address uh, any of these activities. As a matter of fact, it was the states that successfully brought actions against lenders, such as Countrywide and AmeriQuest, for their uh, abusive lending practices in the subprime mortgage market. In the second panel, former Maine Attorney General Jim Turney will talk about these and other issues uh, a little more. But to begin with, I want to ask, a simple question to you. What happened at the FTC? Well, Why did the FTC not take aggressive actions against mortgage lenders in the earlier part of this decade? Well, well, Mr. Chairman, I would say sometimes the simple questions are the most difficult ones to answer, but let me try to respond. Um, First of all, I think, you know, as you know, we are a tiny agency by Washington standards. We have 270 attorneys doing consumer protection, and as Mr. Radonovich and others mentioned, we cover the entire waterfront of the economy with a few exceptions like common carriers. So um, um, we have to, and you know, we spend a lot of time doing things like stopping fraud, going after spyware, as you know, because we've talked about that together. Um, having said that, I think we did a pretty good job. Um, you know, we brought 70 cases in the last five years. We've gotten in the last 10 years $465 million in consumer redress, and that's just in this area of financial services alone. Um, could we have done more? Yeah, I think we could have done more. Will we do more in the future? Yes. And do we need to work with uh, the state uh, attorneys general? Yes. And we do it all the time. We're part of several regional task forces. Um, the director of our Atlanta office, our southeastern regional office, has actually set up uh, a task force with the uh, state AGs, and, and they're going after predatory, uh, predatory lending. But yes, we can do more. Um, I've been exchanging phone calls with Attorney General Holder um, about uh, resurrecting something called the Executive Working Group, uh, which involved the Federal Trade Commission, uh, the state AGs, and uh, the Justice Department. And it was something that was used in the 1990s and the 1980s uh, to sort of coordinate efforts. Uh, I think we're going to resurrect that. And uh, I think that would be, a, you, you can ask uh, Attorney General uh, uh, Tierney, but uh, I believe that that will be something that's welcomed by all the state AGs and it'll allow us to help coordinate even more. You asked for new authorities for the FTC, such as additional rulemaking authority, the ability to seek civil penalties, and possibly additional authority over banks and other depository institutions. But there are critics. and. Uh, some of them on this panel, or on the next panel, rather, 
And they argue that the commission hasn't been aggressively using the authority it already has. My question is, given the FTC's record over the past eight years, why should we give this authority to you now? How can you assure us that you will use these authorities to aggressively protect America's consumers? Well, I, I think, you know, you raise a, a, a very fair question, but I, I'd say this. Um, we are hamstrung, um, speaking for myself, we are hamstrung by the Magnuson-Moss rulemaking uh, uh, process. Uh, when you have passed laws like can spam, Graham Leach, Bliley, FACTA, you've given us APA rulemaking authority so that we can do rules more quickly. But ma and a Mag-Moss rule, and, 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 and I think Mr. Radonovich raised the, con raised the rationale for making rulemaking and, and, and Congressman Stearns too, for making rule, rulemaking more complicated under Magmos. It's a legitimate argument. But what we have found is that sometimes it takes six or eight years to do rulemakings. And when, you, when it takes six or eight years to do rulemakings, it is impossible to do a rulemaking in a timely manner uh, to stop uh, or to respond to a crisis. So for example, two years ago, we did a sweep of internet advertising uh, for mortgages, and we found facially deceptive ads in over 200, 200 different, 200 different uh, companies on the internet. Um, and the Commission has had discussions about what should we do about this. Well, we ended up bringing some cases against the worst malefactors. We wrote letters to everybody. Some people cleaned up their work. But we couldn't do a rulemaking because under MAGMOS rules, by the time we started or finished the rulemaking, um, we knew that Congress would legislate in this area as they should. And so if we can have some relief from MAGMOS, I think we can be more effective in, in helping consumers. And it's a, it's a legitimate debate. Uh, you know, I think when, we, when you reach our reauthorization, which I know you want to do this year, we'll have a discussion about the broader, uh, 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 about broader MAGMOS rulemaking relief and finding malefactors. But again, you can be much more effective if you have finding authority, you can be mu which we don't have for violations of Section 5. You can be much more effective if you can do some sort of streamlined rulemaking authority too. <clears throat> My time is up, uh, but I want to inform the members of the subcommittee if the chairman uh, will uh, indulge us. We want to go through a second round of questionings. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from California for five minutes, Mr. Rodonovich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, welcome, Mr. Leibowitz, to the subcommittee. Congratulations on your recent appointment. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, I did want to ask a couple questions. Uh, this first one, I'm going to ask about five questions to the subject matter about uh, uh, why would you like the FTC to have an APA notice and comment rulemaking to define unfair deceptive acts for financial services? Is Why isn't the current Section 5 authority um, sufficient? Well, I'd say, I'd say two things. Um, uh, first of all, in the Omnibus uh, Act, we have uh, a finding authority for the f rules that the Fed issued under the FTC Act and rulemaking authority. We're going to use that to go after deceptive and unfair mortgage servicing and in some other areas. Um, why do we want expanded rulemaking authority? Because we think when you write rules, you can set standards for an entire industry. And here, where you have um, where you have many, many actors, it's better to try to set standards. And also where we've seen a pattern in practice of bad behavior by many companies, not all, but many. And so we think it would be helpful. It would make us a more effective agency here. Do you have thoughts on what kind of rules you'd like to propose for the activities that are not already covered under existing statutes? Um, w we do. Uh, I think uh, debt negotiation would be would be one area. Um, we'd want to work with the committee in in thinking about other areas. But uh, but yes, we, we we do, and we can get back to you with some more okay. thoughts on that. What about the uh, um, what 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 would be the most pre prevalent consumer fraud violations in financial services that that you think the FTC should be pursuing um, that it currently can't? Well, I mean, I guess I'd say this. We found a fair amount of fraud in the entire life cycle of, of, of the mortgage instrument. Um, and when you have an economic downturn as severe as the one that we're in now, uh, I, I think there's more of an incentive to see more of this. So, um, you know, we're, we're in the mortgage area. We now have that rulemaking authority. It was given to us in the omnibus. Uh, we think that's going to be helpful. We think we're going to be able to find malefactors and write good rules. Uh, uh, but I, I think, and we've deployed more resources. We've really doubled our resources in the last two years to go after predatory financial practices. Having said that, 
Uh, there's just no shortage of bad acts that we can look at in this area. Most companies, of course, do the right thing, but there are a lot of people who've just been ripping off consumers, and the cases that we brought today sort of attest to that. Right, yeah, and I'll get on to those cases that you brought um, in just a second. One more quick question, though. Why can't the Commission use your existing authority to, to propose rules uh, defining unfair acts and practices for financial services? Why can't you use what you have now? Well, again, we could do it, but if they're not the, if, if it's not under APA rulemaking, notice and comment rulemaking, um, then it takes us literally years to do the rulemaking. I don't think that serves the American people well. I don't think it effectuates what you want us to effectuate on this committee. Okay, thanks. Now, with regard to the, the uh, cases that you mentioned, that you've listed uh, and presented a very good record of, of the cases that the Commission has brought under a multitude of laws that you already have to enforce, but unscrupulous actors continue to violate the law. Uh, will more re Will more laws or rules reduce that fraud? They can't. I, I, I think, look, and we'll have some of this discussion going forward when, we, when you look at our reauthorization. I think growing the agency would be something that would be enormously important. We have about 1,100 employees. We do antitrust and consumer protection. In 1980, we had 1,800 employees, and uh, the population in the United States was uh, a third smaller than it is now. So part of it is more resources. Um, but I also think part of it is uh, the ability to have uh, the ability to have rulemaking uh, authority. And you've got to balance this idea of dealing with the bad actors, and, and there may be more of them out there, you know, during this financial crisis or not. I, I, I don't know how you measure how many bad actors are out there, but but you know, the the other side of over enforcement is is uh, higher compliance costs. And where do you where do you find the balance to where you're re regulating so much that that you know, we have higher uh, cost of goods out there as a result of it. Well, well Congressman, you're right. I mean, uh, we have to strike the right balance. And, and reasonable people can disagree about exactly where that balance should be. But look, we've brought, we've brought 68 cases in the last five years in the financial services area against malefactors. We have no fining authority. 47 attorneys general, I believe, uh, have fining authority. Uh, to go after people who violate the law. And so finding authority is something you get for violating a rule, and that would make us much, that would be a very important tool in our arsenal. And by the way, when you've passed pieces of legislation like can Spam, which came out of this committee, you've given us that finding authority, at least for specific matters. So it's a discussion that we, we want to have with you um, going forward, but uh, uh, that would be one thing that would make us more effective, I think. All right. Thank you for your answers, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're back. The chair, thanks to the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from California, Ms. Matsui, for two for five minutes for questioning. Um, Chairman Leibowitz, as I mentioned in my opening statement, the issue of loan modification scams is a growing problem, particularly in California, where we have the highest numbers of homes going into foreclosure. We hear individuals and companies advertising on radio and television with a simple message that they can lower your mortgage payment and stop your foreclosure. And many of these people are calling themselves foreclosure consultants or in some cases acting like they were government agencies like HUD. Right. They make guarantees and promises to homeowners seeking help to save their homes. But this help usually comes with a price tag in the form of an advance fee between $1,500 up to $9,000. That being said, I'd like to hear what the FTC is doing to crack down on these fraudulent loan modification scams. In your written testimony, you announced two new cases targeting mortgage foreclosure rescue scams, bringing a total to eight such cases. Is enforcement the right approach to ending this type of fraud? You initiated eight cases. Will those cases serve as a deterrent to other scammers? And are there other steps that the FTC can take? to end these practices. Right. Well, that's a great question. And, and we do think that these, and by the way, I should mention that we are also members of the Sacramento Task Force oh. um, and, uh, and many yeah. task forces in, uh, in, in your districts around the country. Um, uh, it, it, well, I, I do think that the, 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 the cases against uh, Hope, Now, Pri Hope Now and New Hope, which are two entities that are uh, uh, claiming or, or claiming to be affiliated with the Hope Now Alliance are ones that will be helpful as a deterrent, but we also think that uh, rulemaking authority and fining uh, authority will make our ability to deter more effective. Um, and again, we want to do uh, we want to do rules because they're needed in the mortgage servicing area, in the mortgage modification and and, and uh, rescue area. 
uh, and going after rescue scams. So w w we like to be able to use the whole arsenal. Um, we've been given some authority in the uh, of, in the uh, Omnibus Appropriations Act that will be helpful. We're looking for more authority from this uh, committee, and we uh, we want to move forward with that if the committee believes it's appropriate. Okay. Uh, some examples of fraudulent schemes are these, as we mentioned, the advanced fee scams, where you know consumers are charged for services and never rendered, right. and in exchange for this fee, it's up from fifteen hundred dollars to nine thousand. Homeowners are promised guarantees to save their homes. In some cases, consumers usually pay these fees with a credit card, which should make it easier to track the payment and help the consumer recoup their money. What is the government doing to help recoup these advance fees to make consumers whole again? And is there a mechanism in place to help consumers recoup their advance fees? Sure. I mean, when we bring these cases, uh, and by the way, the Hope Now case is a case that involved an advance fee of $1,000 to $1,500. Um, my understanding is that when consumers, that, the consumers got no help whatsoever or very little assistance, when they asked for their money back, it was gone. So when we bring these cases, we try to ask for a disgorgement of, pro of, of, uh, of profits. We try to get redress to consumers. Uh, in the case we brought against Bear Stearns' uh, subsidiary, uh, EMC, we got 86,000 redress checks issued. Uh, but it's tough because sometimes these assets dissipate and um, sometimes uh, uh, and sometimes it's hard to determine, um, you know, not in these cases, but in other cases, um, w w which loans were fraudulently made or which, which advertisements were deceptive and which ones weren't. And that's why a, a penalty authority will be very helpful to us if we can get it. Well, do you think Congress should ban these advance fees? I would want to come back. I would want to think about that. Um, I would want to think about that. We've certainly seen experience. Uh, we've certainly had experience uh, with these advance fee scams, uh, that, uh, uh, including advance fee credit card scams, uh, that uh, uh, that make us think that you know, certainly the practices of a lot of companies should be should be prohibited. Uh, but as for advance fees generally in the financial services area, um, I, I would want to think about that because there may be some value when legitimate companies are doing some things with advance fees. Um. So would you think then that the FTC should declare its view that it's an unfair practice to charge an advance fee for services that do nothing to save a home? Well, I would certainly think that we could look at that in the context of our rulemaking and uh, uh, some some states, I believe, do ban advance fees uh, in the financial services area. So it's something we can we can take a look at. Okay. And, and I think we probably should in the context of any rulemaking authority we've been given in the omnibus or that you give us additionally. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And I see my time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chairman, I recognize the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Lee Terry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate this. Uh, the gentlelady brings up, I, I think, several good points, uh, and I think really gets to the heart of the matter, and that's uh, if we're going to streamline rules, uh, the procedures for the rules, we want to make sure that they're, uh, it's going to be effective in protecting uh, consumers and that you will be able to use the FTC's authority. Uh, but the argument here about advance fees begs the question of who is ultimately going to be able to decide what is deceptive and what is not. Uh, sometimes it's obvious where you can put 100 people together and they'll say that practice is deceptive. There are other things like maybe advanced fees that some people will say are deceptive or that are wrong, but they're not deceptive. And so how are we going to split those hairs in if, if you're coming to us and asking us uh, to streamline the rules uh, or the procedures to make your rulemaking, uh, who should have the authority in there to determine which specific practice is deceptive or not deceptive? Well, well I think that's right. And then, and then some practices may be deceptive as 
practiced by some companies, whereas other companies may do them in a legitimate way. I, I, I'd only point that, this out. That's why it's really hard. We're, we're right. It's a good question. And, and, and whether we have, whether we're bringing cases or whether we are enforcing rules that we've promulgated, we have to go before a federal judge. So there is that mechanism uh, uh, as a check and balance against, you know, any accesses of the FTC. And, but I don't believe that anybody has suggested, at least in the last 25 years, that we have engaged in any accesses at, the, at our agency. I think people think that we're a pretty good – I think people think that we're a pretty good agency and we try to do the right things with our limited resources and leverage those resources. The, uh, uh, in specific about streamlining the rule process so you can be more nimble. Uh, right. Do you have specifics for us or is that just a, kind of a general statement that that would be helpful for you? Well, I think, I think it's both in the sense that if we have a, um, if we have more agile rulemaking, something closer to APA rulemaking, we can respond more quickly. Um, I, I, I do think that we're going to, you know, use the APA rulemaking authority given to us in the Omnibus Act, uh, in the Omnibus, uh, in the Omnibus Act, uh, to address foreclosure rescue scams, where we know there are very, very serious problems, uh, mortgage modification, uh, where we know there are problems. We know that both because it, we've testified to it and others have, and also because of the Bear Stearns case, where we saw lots of embedded fees that consumers just didn't know about and were being hit with. Yeah, those get to be fairly obvious. And, and let me just let me just add. But my, go ahead. Staff, my staff pointed out uh, uh, that advance fees are prohibited under CROA. Uh, we prohibit them in the telemarketing sales rule rules, which is an FTC rule. Um, and uh, in some in some instances, not in every area, but in some instances, there's really sort of help cleaned up bad practices that harm consumers. All right. And those were developed within your own rules. You decided that uh, in those instances, the, the, the telemarketing sales fees? rules. The telemarketing sales rules uh, were uh, uh, were uh, promulgated pursuant by us, pursuant to legislation by uh, enacted by Congress in the early 1990s, I believe. Right. But for those specific instances, with the specifics of advance fees, that was something that you did within the FTC by rulemaking. Yes, that's exactly and, right. And that's the point that I'm getting to. I guess there's, there's two sides of the coin that we can look at here. And the one is we can say, criticize the FTC over the last eight years for not being aggressive enough. Eight years from now, are we going to look back at the FTC when we streamline your rules and say you were overly aggressive? And without specific congressional approval defining general practices as deceptive practices, thereby freezing trade. It, it, look, it, it's a fair question, but I think in these times of, you know, where we where we have seen so much harm to consumers by deceptive acts and practices, you might want to, given that we're an agency that has a track record for being aggressive but balanced, you might want to err on the side of giving us more authority. Believe me. Uh, in the 1960s and 70s, Congress was always able to pair us back when they thought we were going a little bit too far. Um, but again, you know, uh, in areas like debt collection, in-house debt collection, where we've seen problems, including in the Bear, including in the Bear Stearns case, and debt negotiation, those would be areas not covered by the omnibus where we well, think we could do. In my last 14 seconds, uh, I'm just very curious. In the last several years, you said in the financial services area, you've brought 40 or 60. S 68 cases. 68 complaints. Generally, what were those? Uh, what's the major area specifically? It's, 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 it's really a combination of different areas. It's uh, seven mortgage advertising, uh, five payday loan cases, six payday loan cases, uh, a couple of fair lending cases, mortgage servicing cases, uh, foreclosure, nine foreclosure rescue scam cases, uh, and 12 credit counseling cases, and 11, 11 debt collection cases. Those are the, and credit, and, sorry, and 17 credit repair uh, cases as well. So it's a combination of, it's different areas, um, all mostly within our financial services group. And then we've had our regions, we have seven regions around the, regional offices around the company, country doing more of this, uh, doing more in this area, because it's a high priority for us. Gentlemen's time is up. The chair now recognizes the vice chair of the subcommittee, Mr. Schakowsky, for the five minutes for test. Thank you. Chairman Leibowitz, since 2001, state attorneys general have been active, often aggressively pursuing the bad actors in the field of consumer credit. They took the lead on cases like household finance, AmeriQuest, country, Countrywide, 
and uncovered extensive uh, abusive practices, inflated appraisals, fabricated income statements, misrepresentations to borrowers, illegal and deceptive fees and, and, and rates. Was the FTC approached to participate in um, these activities? I, you know, some of those cases took place before I came to the Commission. I believe in Ameridet, which is a terrific case done by the state AGs, um, we approached them about whether they needed our help because we're always happy to help with uh, uh, cases, and we work a lot with state AGs, and I think that they were, uh, I, I think that they demurred on that, that they were, okay, but they were moving ahead. My, my understanding is that, in fact, the Commission has often opted not to part participate. In fact, a, a former uh, Attorney General, James Tierney, who uh, will be sitting on our second panel, in his testimony, he states that the past eight years have been a time of limited cooperation between the FTC and state attorneys general uh, with respect to enforcing consumer protection in the areas of consumer credit and debt. So I, would you agree with this assessment? Well, I, I, would, say, I would say this. I can't speak for the first uh, uh, I can't speak for the first four years, from 2000 to 2004, I wasn't at the Commission. From 2005 through, uh, through now, we have been working fairly often with the states. We are involved in regional task forces. Um, but look, we can certainly step it up and we certainly will. And one of the things that I'm very heartened about is our very positive conversations with Attorney General Holder about resurrecting the executive uh, working group, which had, uh, which had sort of, uh, which was very active in the 1990s and sort of uh, uh, was flailing, uh, flailing um, uh, in the last eight years. Um, it's a way for us to help coordinate with the Justice Department and with state AGs through regular meetings our consumer protection activities. So I think that will be a big plus. Wonderful. I, and I, I, and, and I we want to do more going to forward. Um, let, me, let me talk about a, a, a different area. Under Section 18 of the FTC Act, whenever the Commission promulgates a rule on unfair or deceptive acts or practices dealing with uh, credit, consumer credit matters, the Federal Reserve and other banking agencies are required to promulgate a, sim a similar rule for depository institutions or explain why such a rule is un unnecessary. So were we to give the FTC speedier APA rulemaking under Section 18 of the FTC Act, um, would this um, not ameliorate at least somewhat the lack of functional regulatory parity because of the reciprocal requirements under Section 18, whereby banking agencies have to consider the FTC's lead? It, it, well, well, Congresswoman, it, it, it might very well be helpful. But I think what your question touches on, and I know you know this, is the sort of incredible balkanization, right? Consumers right. don't know whether they got a – consumers don't care whether they got a mortgage from a bank or whether it came from a mortgage, a non-bank mortgage right. company, right? If it's deceptive, if it's, you know, a subprime loan or a non-subprime loan with, with hidden fees that they don't know about, it's hurting them. So we have this sort of balkanization of, 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 of authority here. There are three or four different banking entities or banking agencies that have some jurisdiction. Right over the 60 percent of the mortgages that are issued by banks. We have uh, the jurisdiction over the others. And, and I think that that's why Elizabeth Warren and uh, Professor at Harvard and uh, uh, a variety of, of folks on the Hill are thinking, you know, that it may be time to have a uh, one single entity that protects consumers uh, from predatory financial instruments. And, and, and uh, uh, certainly I know people on this committee are thinking about that, and, and I want to make sure that, uh, that you know from our perspective we're a consumer protection agency. So you could do banks as well, is what you're saying? W we could do banks as, we could do banks as well. I, I would say with this qualification, the banking agencies, you know, they're mostly concerned with safety and soundness. We don't do safety and soundness, so we're, right. not, we're not those kinds of bank regulators. But if you want an entity to do consumer protection, for, cons for consumers who have financial instruments, we can do that really, really well. Okay, let, let, me, let me ask the, the final thing. Sure. Um, there was a colloquy on the Senate floor that clarified the authority that is this uh, trigger mm -hmm. um, under Section 18 only apply, did not, was not under Section 18 and only applied to non-banks. Do you see this, if it goes forward, as a missed opportunity? Well, you know, I, 
Do I personally see it as a missed opportunity? I certainly think Congress needs to look at the notion of a single entity, whether it's housed in the FTC or whether it's a new one, to protect consumers from predatory financial instruments, deceptive and unfair ones. Um, I see this as actually an opportunity for us because the language in the Omnibus Appropriations Act gives us rulemaking throughout the entire life cycle of a mortgage, only, of course, for non-bank issued mortgages. But that's a real opportunity to do rulemaking, to, um, uh, uh, and after we do rulemaking, to actually be able to, to, to have standards, you get those from rules, and to find malefactors who fall below those standards. So, y y so I, I, I see your point, and, I, you know, and we are very supportive of, of Congress having a discussion about you know, creating a, uh, an entity to protect consumers here. But I also think we've been struggling for this, for this legislation for quite some time. It's, it's, it's going to be helpful to us. Thank you. <coughs> The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Ohio, Ms. Sutton, for five minutes. Thank you so much, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, for your commitment to, to look after um, the, entire, the entire life cycle of credit. Um, there are so many questions that I have I'm going to probably uh, need to follow up after the, the course of this hearing to try and unravel exactly what is going on out there because I can tell you that my, uh, my constituents are feeling the effects of all of this confusion that we're kind, we're, it's kind of confusing for anyone who's watching this hearing to figure out who has authority over what mm -hmm. and who has the responsibility to protect them, um, let alone, you know, know where to turn. So in the last line of questioning um, from my distinguished colleague, um, Representative, Representative Schakowsky, we're talking about the new opportunity you have with the within limits mm -hmm. um, for rulemaking, but if I was to ask you this question, it sounds to me like um, you have limited opportunity for rulemaking that will provide some people protection, right. but there's a whole other category of people out there who may be suffering from the very same thing and the same practices over which you have no ability to help them. Is That's, that correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, let me go on record as saying I don't think that makes any sense. No, that so. makes a lot of sense. And again, you know, <laughs> it, it, and I mean, going back to Ms. Schakowsky's questions, um, one of the other things that's uh, sort of peculiar about this rulemaking is that the Fed can enact, promulgate rules under the FTC Act right. by notice and comment rulemaking, APA rulemaking, the simple rulemaking that we can then enforce for our, uh, over non-bank mortgage companies, over, over, over non-bank uh, uh, issued mortgages. But if we want to do that rulemaking right now, it would have to be under Magnus and Moss, and it would never get done, because contested rulemakings under Magnus and Moss just don't get done. So we're glad that they promulgated these rules. We're glad we can enforce them. We think those rules are going to be helpful in curbing okay. uh, bad advertising and things like liar's loans. But, but it, is, uh, it, it, it is like trying to, even for the commission and all of the commissioners are very, very hardworking. Um, you know, it is like running through a rabbit warren to try to figure out um, how these uh, laws interact and regulations interact with each other. Well, again, I appreciate that very much because it seems like we, we should be able to inject some more um, sense into the process and, and, and into this puzzle. Um, in your testimony on page eight, you talked about um, suing a credit card marketing company. Um, obviously, you can reach the credit card marketing company. Um, can you tell me what, what, what exactly is a credit card marketing company? Well, we can't reach, as you know, we can't reach bank-issued right. credit cards, um, which is about, I think someone said 75 percent. I think it's now probably up to about 95 percent. So a credit card marketing company is simply a non-bank affiliate or surrogate that markets the credit card. And what we found with some of our advanced fee cases is they'll say, you can have a credit card, give us $500, and then when you give them $500, some of it's taken away by fees, by monthly, by, by prohibitive monthly costs, and or you can only use the credit card to buy from their catalog. So those are the, some of the types of cases we brought. And then we had a major case involving a company called CompuCredit, which we brought jointly with the banking agencies, uh, where they had, um, uh, uh, and it was a credit card company that actually targeted a, a, a subprime borrowers, people who couldn't otherwise get credit cards. So that's a sort of laudatory at some level. But uh, the credit card limit was $300. Uh, 
uh, and the first month had $185 in fees, which weren't right. accurately disclosed, we alleged. And we had a settlement for $115 million for consumers just at the end of last year. That was very, very important for us. Okay. So the question that I have, though, is if a bank is engaging in the exact same activity, can you do anything about it? Um, you know, we could run across the hall to the banking agencies where they're testifying and tell them they should take a look at it. We can go talk to them, but we can't do anything about it. That's, that's my point, and that's my concern. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'll hold uh, my questions at this point till the next round. The Chair, thanks to the gentlelady. The Chair now recognizes my friend, the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Pitts, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Leibowitz, uh, as an overwhelming number of mortgage fraud cases uh, began to surface in 2007, the FBI formed a financial crimes task force and has had more cases than it can handle, and these are largely criminal fraud cases. Does the FTC have a role in investing these cases? If so, would you elaborate? I, I, I want to get back to you on those cases. Um, we do a lot of work with the postal inspectors. We do some work with the FBI, of course. But when we see something that's criminal, um, we generally refer it to the Justice Department. Um, and, and if they'll take it, that's, they have you know, more appropriate sanctions than, than we do. We you know, generally can only get redress and disgorgement. Uh, so, um, and stop the bad conduct. So sometimes we're sort of the fallback entity for going after fraudulent behavior in this area. Um, but I, I will get back to you on whether we've worked with the FBI task force specifically. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the commission has conducted research on ways to improve uh, mortgage disclosure. If the disclosure documents were simplified in a manner that provided relevant information, similar to the prototype disclosure developed by the Commission. Would that have prevented any of the fraud in, um, that occurred in the home market, mortgage uh, loan market, in your opinion? Or might fraudsters simply find a way around that simplified uniform disclosure? Well, I would say this. Fraudsters, you know, can often find a way around even simplified disclosures. And I, I hope all of you have the, 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 the draft disclosure form on your desk. If not, we'll make sure we get you copies. Um, but sometimes uh, uh, what's happening is that consumers don't see embedded fees. And what we've done with our sort of disclosure form, it's simple. We've copy tested it. In other words, we've asked consumers to look at this and compare it to the existing HUD, RESPA, TILA forms that they use. And, and those forms have both, they're both over-inclusive and under-inclusive. They have too much information so consumers don't know what to focus on. And they don't focus on some specific aspects of information. So can I say to you that, um, uh, can I say to you that uh, it, it would prohibit, it would have stopped a specific fraud? I don't think so. But would it have sort of helped some consumers make more informed decisions when they're dealing maybe not with deception but more with unfairness? I, we think it might have. And, and, and even for, by the way, for consumers, I mean, these, these forms or this draft form and others like it, um, you know, it doesn't just help the consumer who's being ripped off. It helps the consumer who wants to be able to make informed choices, right? You can see, well, here, you know, the fees are going to be more, and here the fees will be, here's the, here the fees and the overall uh, cost of the loan will be less. So that's, you know, just helping consumers like all of us make, make, the, make choices from among competitors. Now, the FTC prohibits both unfair Mm -hmm. and deceptive practices. That's correct. Unfair is defined as any act that causes or is likely to cause substantial injury to consumers, which is not reasonably avoidable by consumers themselves and not outweighed by countervailing benefits to consumers or to competition. Uh, bringing an enforcement action for violation of a deceptive practice is much more common for the FTC. Why right. are unfair cases brought so infrequently? Well, I think, you know, you articulated, I think you read directly from the statutory authority we have. Um, they are, it, it is harder to show unfairness. Unfairness is uh, a, a, a sometimes more amorphous term. So when we see, I mean, when we're going after your usual, you know, a typical bottom feeder who's ripping off consumers, we just see, I mean, it's clear deception. Um, but sometimes, for example, in our spyware cases, uh, and in a variety of other cases involving uh, uh, data security and, 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 and internet-related 
uh, 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 problems, uh, we'll use our unfairness. We've been using it actually more in the last several years because we think it's important. Should uh, unfair acts be better defined to provide greater certainty uh, to make enforcement easier? Uh, um, uh, there was, I, I would say certainly if we had a little more leverage uh, in our unfairness standard, we might be able to bring unfairness cases more often. Um, we had a much broader standard uh, in the 1960s and 70s, uh, and then, and, and, and in, in through the, and through the late 1970s, and then Congress uh, uh, asked us to modify first of our own volition. Uh, and then it put it in the statute, I think, in 1992, um, our unfairness authority. So, um, I, I, so this has been a subject of some debate going back and forth about whether we should have a little more flexibility here. We'd love to work with you on this. Thank you. Uh, my time is up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, an, an issue came up just now, and I was going to ask you. Uh, is there any numbers that the FTC could get to share with the committee on the number of criminal prosecutions that are referred to the Justice Department that actually are taken by the Justice Department? Because I think that's something we'd like to see. Yeah, we will get you, uh, we will, we will get you that information. We do have a, uh, a, a Tim Uris, uh, who was the first chairman under President Bush, set up a criminal liaison unit. Um, and uh, it, which we, which is still, which we still have and which we, which takes some of the cases that are clearly of a criminal nature where we started investigations and sends it over to, uh, to the Justice Department or to certain other prosecutors. So we can get you that information. S some of it, with a caveat that I, I have to go back and look, some of it may be confidential. And then sometimes, again, as you know from the cases, because you know our agency. Um, we just need the numbers. To yeah, we'll get you the numbers. And, and if there are cases that are definitely not controversial, it would be interesting to see what type of cases may not be accepted and what type would be. But right. I can just tell you, as a, as a general matter, sometimes the cases don't rise to the level of ones that the Justice Department wants to prosecute, so we do it ourselves. Okay. And you have the ability to do it yourself? Not as a criminal matter, but as a civil matter. On the civil side. So, okay. right. To stop ongoing harm. Okay. Our office has been hearing from constituents concerned that the free credit reports that do not list all the information that credit lending entities have access to. Do you know if there is a case, and if so, do you believe consumers should have access to all this information? It seems that consumers should have access to all the credit information available to them. Uh, have you heard of that, or has that been an issue with the FTC? Yeah, we, we, I, I think if we're, uh, we brought a case, I think in 2002 or 2003, before I got to the commission against freecreditreport.com uh, for, I, I think I'm summarizing it, but I believe for actually charging fees. Uh, there is a, a place where consumers can go to get, to get a free credit report without, without entering into a contract, a monthly contract, and I think that's called annual, annual credit report, annual credit report, and um, and we actually, not to make light of this, but we actually put out a, a spoof of freecreditreport.com that got picked up uh, by YouTube and by a variety of other media outlets uh, just two weeks ago. So uh, this is an area of some concern to us, and I know to consumers we do get complaints on this. Well, I'm what I was going to say, there may be things that the consumer may not, uh, it's not on that report that's being used or, for their credit rating. That's right. It shouldn't be in there. That was the issue. Credit well, reports. Well, well, uh, credit scores. Right. Are you talking about credit scores? Yeah. Scoring? Yeah. They're included in the, in, the, uh, in the free credit report. And is there any restriction on those, what can be considered to, to go into your credit score, either by practice or by rule or statute? Um, yeah, I don't think so. I can't imagine it being. Why don't they do it? You know, if you have blue. Eye. Let me, let me, let me, uh, Congressman. Let me get back to you on that. It's, a, it's okay. a legitimate question. I want to give you the right answer. Um, I know I only have a minute left, but there's there are many varieties of mortgage foreclosure rescue fraud. But in each case, the per perpetrator makes misleading promises. The consumer home will be saved from pending foreclosure permanently. Most consumers end up losing their home, however, as well as the money they paid to these scammers. I'm aware the FTC took action in February to sue a company operating one of these scams, and I commend you for that. Uh, how widespread is the problem? Does the Commission have the tools and resources to go after a lot of bad actors, not only uh, the one you sued, but it seems like some of it may be even cottage industries that we're seeing in, in, in regional areas and not maybe national. Right. Well, with, um, with the, uh, the entity that we just brought an action against today, 
uh, that's impersonating HUD, we're having a sort of whack-a-mole problem with them because uh, uh, we found the site. The site was, uh, we found the site, um, the HUD inspector general took it down, then it popped up again under a website from Germany, uh, registered in Germany, and then we've taken that site down. So. Um, uh, there are so it is so we have a little long arm problem in terms of asserting our jurisdiction. The other thing is that um, if we can find these malefactors, which uh, the Omnibus Appropriations Act will let us do, or a provision that Senator Dorgan got into the Omnibus Appropriations Act will let us do, um, I think that would be very very helpful. And uh, uh, and we will do a rulemaking on um, foreclosure rescue scams and also deceptive modifications. Okay. And if, yes. if you'd share that with us, even though we're not on particularly, you know, a rider of the appropriations bill and maybe not rise to the need for an authorization, but some of us could help with getting the encouragement of the appropriators to include We'd, that. We would love to work with you. We would love Thank your you. help. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Stupak, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Leibowitz, thanks for being here. Uh, the Commission, as you've indicated, has uh, authority under Section 18 of the Federal Trade Commission Act, and I understand it's particularly cumbersome. Instead of promulgating rules under the APA, the Commission must go through a far more difficult process known as the Magnuson Moss Act. Uh, so, so my question is, uh, since you've been Chair, has the Commission considered promulgating a rule under the Magnuson Moss Act? Or have you just sort of disregarded the whole process? Um, we have a few rules that we're in the process of promulgating outside of this area under MAGMOS, but they're generally sort of not good government rules, but non-controversial rules. Because, because under MAGMOS, if you want to promulgate a rule and right. there's, a, there's an opposition to that rule, um, they get to require an independent referee, multiple rounds of, right. of submissions, um, and it takes a really long time. Do you think uh, Congress should just repeal that? I would say this. There are probably some legitimate reasons why Congress gave us this cumbersome rulemaking. Can you give me one reason why they'd give you such a burdensome procedure? If our purpose off is to protect my, the consumer. Off the top of my head, no. Yeah. But, uh, but, but I would say this. I certainly think some relief from Magnus and Moss would be, uh, would be justified. The, the, I think the original, look, our, we're an agency that Congress wanted to give us when they created us in 1914, uh, enormously broad jurisdiction, but fairly limited remedies, right? As opposed to the Justice Department, right? Where they have to do, go after more specific crimes and they put people in jail. They have fining authority, um, and so the rationale for Magmos, I suppose, is is that it it sort of slows things down because we have such broad jurisdiction. I do think over time what we found is. Uh, that, that some relief to Mag Moss would be helpful in allowing us to have leverage over uh, to have leverage over the bad guys. So, for example, I think 47 attorneys. When you when you promulgate a rule, you can get a fine for a violation of a rule. Otherwise, when we use our Section 5 authority, you can't do that. And and, and so, if we if we can find malefactors, as 47 attorneys generals generals attorneys general can do. Um, that would make us more effective in doing what you want us to do, which is uh, protecting consumers from, you know. But in order to protect consumers, you have to move quicker. I, I mean, we don't want you to be Justice Department because you indicate, well, you don't have fines and all that. But, but isn't really your power is to be, look for that unfair and, and deceptive practices and quickly act quickly to cease and desist? Uh, isn't that really the role of the FTC? It seems like Magnuson. Moss is just the opposite. It slows you down, so you cannot be nimble and react to well, that's exactly, current I mean, trends. Well, that's, exa that's exactly right. In a controversial rulemaking, um, you know, in a rulemaking where there's opposition, and, and, and many good rulemakings have opposition, um, you know, we would always look to see what all stakeholders want. Of course we're going to do that, and we're going to do that in the rulemakings that we've gotten in the omnibus uh, appropriations, which will be APA rulemakings. Right, but, but that, that's, even that's limited. In the omnibus, your your rule make authority that's somewhat limited, is it not? It's it's limited. In the omnibus, it, it, it's a, it applies to mortgages, right? But not not but not other financial instruments not issued by banks, and of course it only goes to uh, non bank issued mortgages. But it's still better than what we had, so we're very grateful for it, and we thank this committee for protecting it in well, the uh, in the omnibus. Well, let, let me ask you this: uh, since 2001, the attorney generals have been active and very aggressive in pursuing 
uh, bad actors in the field of consumer credit. Uh, they took the lead on cases against household finance, AmeriQuest, and Countrywide, and uncovered extensive abusive practices, inflated appraisals, fabricated income uh, statements, misrepresentations to borrowers, borrowers, and illegal and deceptive fees and rates. Uh, was the FTC approached to participate with the AGs uh, in, in their... In, in some cases we have, and we have participated <coughs> with them. Um, in some cases, they've done it on their own, and, and I believe uh, demurred when we've offered help. And, and then probably there are some cases, uh, you know, again, in hindsight, that we should have been involved in earlier, but they took the lead on that. The, the attorneys general have been terrific in, you know, protecting consumers. I don't think we've been slackers at all. I think we've been pretty good. But um, on a going forward basis, we're going to work more with the attorneys general. Okay, so how do you envision working closer relationship between the states as you're now the newly appointed chairmanship? Because I think it's important while the states uh, bring forth, but sometimes they look to you for resources and to help them with these uh, investigations. And I would think that uh, what goes on in one part of the country is probably going on in the other side part of the country, and therefore the FTC should be more involved and should have a work closer working relationship with the state AGs. Well, I, I absolutely agree with that. And of course, we can, we can have, it's easier for us to get remedies that apply across all states, Correct. right? And, and so much of the, uh, of, of so many of the bad acts in the mortgage industry. Well, have example, you reached out to the AGs? Um, Yes, we have reached out to the AGs, and we've also reached out to the Attorney General. You may not have been here when I talked about this, but um, uh, we're in the process of uh, trying to resurrect something called uh, the Executive Working Group, which, okay. uh, uh, which, was in a, which was very active in the 1990s, sort of stopped in the last eight years, uh, that involves justice, the Attorneys General, and the Federal Trade Commission having, a, having, having regular meetings to coordinate activities. Okay. That's going to be very, very helpful going forward. You're right. I didn't hear that earlier testimony. Though. I'm glad to hear it and uh, urge, <coughs> urge you to continue that progress. Thanks. Good. The Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Uh, the Chair now recognizes himself for two minutes of additional questions. Uh, Chairman Liberowitz, uh, if uh, this Congress would enhance and expand your regulatory authority. Uh, can the Commission set up a separate office to regulate and enforce consumer credit abuses? And if so, would this compromise other core functions of the FTC? Well, I would say this. As, as you know, Mr. Chairman, um, you know, we're a small agency with a pretty large mission and we have to leverage our resources all the time. So uh, if you give us that authority, and, and I think a majority of the Commission would be willing to embrace that authority and think we could do good things for consumers, we, w we will need more resources. I don't know that we need to grow to the level we were at in 1980, which was 1,800 uh, uh, FTEs, but I think we, you know, w we would, to discharge what you don't want us to do is to take people away from spyware cases and other types of fraud cases and then simply move them to the newest, most problematic area uh, and forget about all the other things we do. So it's a, I, I, I think we need more resources. I do know the appropriations committees are interested in giving us more resources and have given us small plus ups over the last couple of years because they like what we're doing, but we probably need additional resources on top of that. I have less than one minute, and I just want to ask you another question. I'd like to touch on payday lending. I believe that payday lenders have a role in our economy, but there are far too many abuses. Does the FTC have authority to crack down on payday lending practices, such as rollover fees, and is specific statutory language needed to direct the Commission to adequately deal with certain abuse, uh, abusive payday lending features? Well, I would say I would say yes and no. We've brought about a half dozen payday lending cases in the last five years. Um, we don't have obviously. Congress set a cap, I believe, for payday loans outside of military bases at 36 percent a couple of years ago. We, we obviously don't have the authority to set a cap. But one thing we found in our payday loan cases is um, is the embedded is is that is that. Uh, malefactors have sort of embedded fees that consumers don't know about, and so they'll pay off their loan in two weeks, but it'll be a day late. And so then there'll be a fee that pops up, and then it's compounded, and then they're sort of in a worse cycle of debt. So we have the authority to do that. I think if you gave us the authority to go, if you gave us the authority to do rulemakings, um, we would look at ways to, to promulgate rules that would require better behavior by a lot of the payday lenders. 
The chair recognizes now the uh, Mr. Rodanovich for two minutes for additional questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Mr. Leibovich, you had mentioned that <clears throat> commissioners decided not to initiate a rulemaking on uh, deceptive Internet advertising. And um, the reason was because Congress would eventually act on the issue, but you w would have if you could proceed under the APA. And it sounds like, and I'm going to have a discussion about this, that you're suggesting that the FTC APA rulemaking would obviate the need for legislative for a legislative body at all. And adding to that question, I, I, I think um, I would ask is, isn't the Magnuson Moss process intentionally deliberate? Uh, similar to the congressional legislative process? I mean, you know, the founding fathers set this whole thing up so that legislating was difficult, and should your do job be made easier, or should you have to deliberate with us? Well, we always, you know, always the proper our job approach be, to these all problems. All of us think our job should be made easier, but right. um, the, uh, I don't mean to suggest that we would have obviated the need for congressional legislation if we had been able to do a rulemaking. And I don't mean to say that we wouldn't have stopped, you know, the economic mess that we all know we're in. But I, I, I do think we could have cleaned things up more quickly if we had APA rulemaking or something closer to APA rulemaking. But again, these were just discussions among commissioners because we knew that under APA, we knew that under MAGMOS rulemaking, um, it would be very, very hard to do a rule in a timely in a timely manner. And, uh, and, and that's the problem with, with MAGMOS rulemaking. I, I don't mean to say that there isn't. I don't know if you're here when I was talking, uh, having a conversation with uh, Mr. Stupak. I, there's a rationale for having us r make rules more slowly. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and certainly um, among folks who follow the FTC and have for, for years and decades, there might have been some excesses uh, perceived or real in the 1970s that led to some of our, uh, some of the restrictions, for example. Uh, the uh, the restriction on unfairness that makes, as Mr. Pitts pointed out, makes it difficult for us to bring an unfairness case. But having said that, I, I think it's worth, and I know you, I know you're interested in just discussing this issue further about whether it makes sense to give us some relief from MAGMOS. Doesn't necessarily mean it has to go all the way over to APA rulemaking, mm -hmm. but I do think in some areas, you know, you want us to be able to act more nimbly, more agilely, and more quickly. Maybe not in every area, but in some. And when you've passed new rules or new laws, like, like can't spam, you've given us that APA rulemaking, and we have that APA rulemaking in the omnibus for, uh, uh, for mortgages, for everything in the, mortgage, in, in the mortgage life cycle. So, I mean, one thing is watch to see how we do in the mortgage uh, with the rulemaking authority we have. If we do a balanced job, maybe it makes sense to give us just a little bit longer leash. All right, thank you. Thank you. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Ohio for two minutes. So. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you heard uh, some discussion here about the state attorney generals, and in my opening statement, I talked about some of the actions that we have taken in Ohio. But um, even after all that we have done, I'm going to read to you the headline of a report from the Housing Research and Advocacy Center um, that is in Cleveland. The headline reads, Payday Lenders Operating in 81 Ohio Counties Charging counties charging up to 680 percent interest. Lenders avoiding the 28 percent APR cap passed by legislature and voters, that's at the state level, um, in 1,020 stores statewide. And just to, to, to give you an idea of what's happening here, despite legislation passed in 2008 aimed at lowering interest rates on short-term loans, payday lenders are operating, as the headline reads, in 81 of Ohio's 88 counties, um, making loans in some cases that carry that extraordinary annual percentage rate 24 times more the rate that was approved by the legislature for, for such lending. Um, and they've avoided the 28 percent cap by using other laws. So, so they're very crafty um, and, and they're very quick at making the necessary adjustments to continue to reap what they reap. I, I guess my, my question just is, what can, what can you do to help? Or what can we do to help? Well, I mean, y y you know, there's no magic bullet for solving these problems, as I'm sure you know. Um, I was asking my staff about usury laws in different states yesterday as I was preparing for the hearing, and someone pointed out that in Missouri the cap is 2,000 percent. So you borrow $100, you forget about it, the next year you owe $2,000. Um, look, one part is working with attorneys general because we have to leverage our limited resources, and uh, that's a part of it. Um, 
Another part is consumer education. We have a terrific consumer education uh, uh, group, um, and uh, uh, that's a part of it. Um, you know, I wish I could tell you there's a particular answer to this problem, uh, but it is, uh, uh, but it is, it, there just isn't. And we all have to sort of pull, t and, and by the way, as more people are unemployed, as, as, as uh, the economy continues to spiral down, you're going to see more of these problems. You're going to see more people borrowing from payday lenders. Now, Congress made the determination that, uh, that outside of military bases, uh, payday lenders should be capped at, I think, 36 percent. I suppose Congress could make the determination that, uh, uh, that payday lenders should be capped at 36 percent and limited in fees. Uh, but that's a decision for you to make. I will say this. If you give us more authority to do rulemaking in this area, we'll take a look at payday loans. With the Chair's indulgence, I appreciate that. And thank you for bringing up the issue about uh, loans uh, near military bases. Um, and I'd like to follow up with you about that as well, because I understand that still problems remain. And I would like to, uh, to, to talk about how we actually aggressively go after that. The Chair, thanks to the gentlelady. And the Chair, thanks to the Chairman again for uh, the expansive use of his time. We know that you are quite busy, and we certainly uh, thank you for your enlightening commentary uh, to this committee. Uh, we do intend to work with you on these and other matters as we proceed, uh, and now we just want to let you know that we appreciate your real presence here. Thank you much, uh, Mr. And the chair yeah. now calls the second panel to the witness table. The chair uh, want to welcome this extraordinary panel uh, before the committee, and um, we want to introduce you individually, and then we will ask that you all stand uh, after the introduction so that we can swear you in. To my left, uh, Mr. James Tierney. He's a lecturer in law at the Columbia Law School, and he's the former Attorney General of Maine. Welcome, Mr. Tierney. Uh, next to Mr. Tierney is Mr. Christopher Peterson, a professor of law at the S.J. Quinney College of Law. Welcome, Mr. Peterson. Uh, next to Mr. Peterson is Mr. Ira Rheingold. He's the Executive Director of the National Association of Consumer Advocates. Mr. Rango, welcome. And next to Mr. Rango is Mr. Nathan Benson. He's the CEO of the Tidewater Finance Company, Incorporated. And he is testifying on behalf of the American Financial Services Association. Welcome, Mr. Benton. And now uh, I'd like to swear the witnesses in. Will the witnesses please stand and raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I let the record reflect that the witnesses all answered in the affirmative. The chair recognizes. Uh, Mr. Turney, for five minutes of, uh, for the purposes of an opening statement. Put, please put the mic you close go. to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Jim Tierney. I'm the director of the National State Attorneys General Program at Columbia Law School. And in that capacity, I work closely with the men and women who serve as your attorneys general and your staff, and all of whom are deeply committed to rooting out fraud in the area of credit. I've Testimony is obviously my own, but I have discussed it with a number of attorneys general, including your own, Mr. Chairman, mm -hmm. uh, Lisa Madigan, uh, and, and I think I broadly reflect the views of those attorneys general who are committed to this important issue. I think if there's one thing that is clear is that we have insufficient consumer protection in the field of credit. That's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. We're not doing enough. Mm -hmm. The crisis is real and it's growing. And if there's one single lesson that has to be received 
in the halls of Congress, in the halls of federal regulators, including the Federal Trade Commission, is that the states got it right and the states got it first. And speaking bluntly, until we have effective state regulation from state attorneys general and state banking commissioners, we will never get ourselves out of this hole. Mm -hmm. The question is, how do we get from here to there? And that is a challenge. And there's a long history of relationships between the federal and state approach to working with these issues. Federal government has a number of very narrow federal statutes enforced by not the Federal Trade Commission, but forced by banking regulatory agencies whose first job is to assure the safety and soundness of the banking community. And we see how well they've done that. But in addition to that, it is their responsibility allegedly to deal with consumer protection, and they just don't do it. It's not their highest priority. It never will. On the state side, you have broader laws, State Unfair, Deceptive, and Trade Practices Act, which are flexible. And state attorneys general get it right and get it first, not because, although they show great leadership and great courage, they get it because they're structured to do it. They live in communities. Like you, they have constituents. They're able to move and move quickly, and they're able to move on a national basis and on a bipartisan basis so that they're able to achieve some very specific and concrete results. Mm -hmm. Now, get to the hearing of the Federal Trade Commission. There's a long history between the Federal Trade Commission and the state attorneys general. Sometimes it's very positive. In the 1970s, federal funding, with the help of the Federal Trade Commission, actually went to the states to get states more involved in consumer protection. Again, during the, during the uh, terms of the first President Bush and President Clinton, again, we had warm and solid relationships where the Federal Trade Commission and the states were on the same side. The last eight years have been very cold years. And I commend our new chairman. Our new chairman did the best he could to explain the facts that he, as he found them. But the bottom line is that the Federal Trade Commission has been on the sidelines on a number of very, very important cases. And this is very unfortunate. Not only were they not involved in the cases, but even informally. They never called up an attorney general and said, what did you learn? What are you seeing about the patterns of fraud? And this is a serious problem. I commend the chairman for reinstituting the executive working group, which I called for in my formalized testimony. It's extraordinarily important. There are some regional directors of the FTC who work with the states. There are some who not. Certainly the FTC are bringing cases. But are these the biggest cases? Or is the FTC showing an instinct for the capillary? Are they striking at the major issues, or are they grabbing onto low-hanging fruit when they go after a case? We don't know. We don't know because people are not sitting down in the same room and discussing how do we put together a systematic, sophisticated process by which we can root out consumer fraud. And that requires a lot of work because there will never be enough lawyers in the Federal Trade Commission, never, 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 to track down the kind of consumer fraud we are seeing. The FTC has to work with the states, state banking commissioners, the private bar, consumer advocacy groups, in other words, all the people that the states work with every day as they fashion the kind of priority prosecutions that are absolutely necessary to make this happen. Now, not only have the states brought the cases that have been alluded to in the earlier testimony, the household, the AmeriQuest, and the countrywide, but they've had to do it with one hand tied behind their back because they're litigating with the same federal agencies who are trying to preempt them from bringing these cases at all. That case is back before the United States Supreme Court again in April. It's a serious issue. The Banking Committee has held hearings on this. It's extraordinarily important that the Federal Trade Commission and the chair of the Federal Trade Commission stand up, as has the chair of the FDIC, Sheila Baer, and said this is not a time to preempt states. We have a problem. We need more consumer protection, not less. Mm -hmm. And the timing is of extreme importance. Mm -hmm. So with that, Mr. Chairman, thank you for giving me this opportunity, and I look forward to answering any questions that you might have. Thank you. The chair now recognizes Mr. Christopher Peterson. Mr. Peterson, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, Ranking Member. Um, it's an honor to be here today and share a few thoughts. Um, I'd like to start with two quick statistics, if I could, about uh, the subprime uh, and alternative mortgage product crisis. Uh, the first is uh, uh, six million, according, uh, roughly six million foreclosures coming through the pipe, uh, according to Credit Suisse. Uh, and then uh, uh, in foreclosure rescue scam cases brought by the Federal Trade Commission, six. Uh, according to their testimony in the Senate last month, they brought six foreclosure rescue scam cases for six million 
foreclosures. That's one in a million. Um, where I come from, that's, a, that's the, the sort of cliche that you talk about when you say that you're not doing anything, right? Uh, in, in my view, um, honorably, the, the Federal Trade Commission is a good agency that does their best, uh, but, but they're not doing anything. We're talking about taking teacups of water out of an ocean. Uh, uh, it, it, it's just not even close to the sort of magnitude of problems that we're talking about. And so, uh, if I could just quickly you know, talk about the rules, the law. I mean, we've all been talking about all these generalizations about, well, good, separating good loans from bad loans. Just talk about the laws for a second. There's the Equal Credit Act. They have, they have four titles of the, of the Consumer Credit Protection Act, and they have their Deceptive Trade Practices Authority. The Equal Credit Opportunity Act is designed to prevent discrimination in awarding credit. It doesn't do anything in the way of preventing bad loans from being made. The Fair Credit Reporting Act, it tries to clear up inaccurate credit information, but that's not the problem that we had here. Uh, lots of people had, had prime credit histories, were still getting non-amortizing loans that have you know, gone in waves into foreclosure. The Fair Debt Collection Practices Act is a nice gesture, but it, it generally doesn't apply to home mortgage loan servicers, and uh, it, it comes too late. I mean, at the point where the loan's already in default and there's debt collection problems, it's too late at that point. Mm -hmm. And then the Truth in Lending Act is a nice idea, but it's too late. The, 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 the disclosures are confusing. People generally just don't read them. They ignore the disclosures. And even if, and even if that was a great strategy, the, the, the statute that's designed to promote honesty and origination of loans doesn't apply to mortgage brokers, who are the people that actually talk to consumers. What sort of a, what sort of a truth, in lending, truth in lending idea doesn't apply to the people who talk to the borrower? Um, uh, and then in, in addition to those four statutes, they also have two significant regulations that they've done uh, under their Deceptive Trade Practices Authority. The Holder in Due Course Notice Rule, which doesn't apply to home mortgages, right? Uh, and that was back in 1975, and it's never been updated. And second, the Credit Practices Rule, which bans uh, about five different, you know, problematic uh, uh, contractual provisions, including confessions of judgment and pyramiding late fees. Uh, but it hasn't been updated since 1984. Uh, uh, and, and this statute is, uh, th this regulation uh, doesn't talk about any of the non-amortizing products and subprime products that, that we are talking about uh, in, in the past few months. And that's it. I just did it. In, in uh, three minutes, I summed up their entire regulatory structure. And it really doesn't do much of anything to try and prevent home mortgage fraud. Uh, uh, so, uh, and what are the barriers that prevent more stuff from taking place? Well, it's true that they have this inefficient regulatory rulemaking process, and it seems to me it would be helpful to get, uh, to, to speed that up. Uh, but the real problem is the fragmented federal regulatory system. Um, I mean, on my hand, I can count 11 different agencies that are supposed to be dealing with this problem. The Federal Reserve Board of Governors, the Office of the Comptroller, the Office of Thrift Supervision, FDIC, the National Credit Union Administration, the, Fair, uh, the, the new Federal Housing Finance Administration, am I getting that right, the new FAO, uh, HUD, SEC, uh, the FBI and Justice at the same time, and then finally the Federal Trade Commission. In this fragmented system, uh, uh, the capital flows to the weakest regulator, like water going down into the basement. Uh, and the result is that there is very, very little actual rulemaking to try and deal with the problematic practices that are actually in our industry. So I, I, you know, I've been coming up with a list of, of all the things that I think need to get done, and I have this gigantic list of, uh, uh, of problems in our statute, you know, in our statutory system. Uh, uh, it's a big list. We're talking a lot of changes that need to be made. Congress could do that, but it's going to be a long and complicated bill. Uh, it's going to be very controversial. You could give it to a federal agency to try and do it, but which one would you choose? The only plausible existing candidates are the Federal Reserve, which already had that authority under the Home Ownership and Equity Protection Act, uh, or the Federal Trade Commission, which is a good choice but has nowhere near the resources and has a too expansive mission. In my view, uh, uh, Honor, uh, respectfully, it's time for a new uh, regulatory agency that deals exclusively with this issue and has authority to pursue uh, 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 protection of consumers on consumer finance issues. And if you're not talking about that, if you're just talking about more tinkering, then you're just kind of kidding yourself and, and you're not really going to fix anything. The chair thanks the gentleman. The chair now recognizes Mr. Rango for five minutes. 
Um, thank you, Chairman, and um, thank you, Ranking Member Rodanovich. It really is quite an honor to testify before you, uh, Congressman Rush. I started my career as a consumer advocate in Chicago, where I began a Legal Assistance Foundation's foreclosure prevention project. And I worked through the mid-90s dealing with all the mortgage crises that we had in Austin and Roseland, all over Chicago. And the things that we saw in Chicago in the 90s, we're seeing nationwide today. Yeah. What I think disappoints me most about today's hearing is I'm going to go through the litany of things that we consumer advocates saw in the 90s, saw in the early 2000s, and we see the exact same thing today. Nothing has changed, in fact, except that things have gotten work and, and there has not been a federal response to it, including the FTC. I think about the world I see. I, I run an organization called the National Association of Consumer Advocates. We're the private attorneys, the legal service attorneys across this country who actually do the consumer advocacy work, who are on the ground every single day representing consumers who are losing their houses or having their car repossessed or being harassed by debt collectors. Um, we see what's going on there, but, but the federal regulatory agencies and the FTC have not talked with us. So what do we have out here? Oh, I should mention, I also run a project called the Institute for Foreclosure Legal Assistance. So I'm in contact and talk daily with all the private attorneys, the legal services attorneys in the community who are actually fighting foreclosures. We are on the ground. We know who the bad actors are. We see the bad practices, and we see what's going on out there. So what do we have? We have a completely broken mortgage lending industry. There's no question about it. Unfairness runs rampant. Bad lending practices are everywhere. We have a broken mortgage servicing system, completely broken. Um, it's unaccountable. They can't figure out how much money people owe. They can't modify a loan to save their lives. We have a, we've seen, Chicago is a perfect place, uh, example of it, of a dual credit market. If you're middle income or rich, you have banks. If you're, if you're poor or you're low income, what do you have? You have uh, currency exchanges, and you have payday lenders, and you have rent to own, and you have refund anticipation loans. It is stealing wealth out of the communities that we care about most, and it's gone on unabated for the last decade with nobody really taking any real action there, and it's only getting worse. We have a debt collection industry that's completely out of control. We have a, a growth of a debt buying industry that's sort of mind-boggling in the way they go about collecting debts without actually even knowing, not having a contract that the person actually engaged, um, had that debt originally from, don't even have any proof that that debt is owed, yet they are using our nation's court and using our nation's private arbitration system to collect debts against people. We have a broken credit reporting system where consumers can't get real access to their credit reports. They don't get the information necessary and they can't fix those reports once they're broken. All of those things are what our credit market looks like today. And when I went and talked to the consumer advocates who I talk to every single day in this, in this country, and I asked them about the FTC and their role over the last eight years and the last 10 years in protecting consumers, I'll just pick some of the adjectives that I got responded. Passive, antagonistic, irrelevant, disengaged, counterproductive, stuck in a world that doesn't regulate. They have not been part of the ball game here. Um, they can cite statistics, they can talk about some cases that they brought. In the scheme of things, it's mostly irrelevant. Now, to be fair to them, they are under-resourced, and there are good career attorneys there who do their best, but the fact is they have been disengaged. I, I, in the eight, I've been in Washington now seven years after I left Chicago, and someday I hope to return. And I can't, on, on one hand, I can count the conversations I've had with the FTC, yet we're the people out there doing this kind of work. We are out there on the street. It really is sort of mind-boggling to me that we sit here today with the problems that existed 10 years ago, and we've had federal regulatory agencies who have done nothing except exacerbated the problem. The Federal Trade Commission, as Chris said, was, like, was using a spoon to clean out an ocean. They simply did not do the job. There's a number of things that can be done to improve them. Hopefully in a new administration they'll be more assertive and more aggressive. They have been completely passive in using their unfairness authority. They need to use it. They need to declare things are unfair. We know when things are unfair. When you give somebody a loan that they can't afford to pay back, that's unfair. It's not a really hard thing to figure out. They do need greater rulemaking authority. It's crazy. I, six to eight years to make a rule to protect consumers, that's just not the way it should work. Um, hopefully they'll have leadership and I hope um, um, Chairman uh, Leibowitz will demonstrate some leadership in terms of being assertive and aggressive in this area. 
um, they should have concurrent authority over the banks. Uh, there's a special place in regulatory hell for the uh, federal bank regulators over the last eight years and their complete failure to what, what's happened here. So hopefully the FTC can use some of their consumer protection powers. I'll stop there but be happy to answer any questions you might have about, um, about the FTC and, and the credit crisis we're facing. Thank you. The chair, the chair now recognizes Mr. Benson for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Rush, Ranking Member Radonovich, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Nathan Benson, and I'm the CEO of Tidewater Finance Company, which I established in 1992 to purchase and service retail installment contracts. The company is based in Virginia Beach, Virginia, and has two lines of business, um, Tidewater Credit Services for consumer goods and Tidewater Motor Credit for auto services. I'm here today in my capacity as a board director of American Financial Services Association, AFSA, whose 350 members include consumer and commercial finance companies, auto finance companies, card issuers, mortgage lenders, industrial banks, and other firms that lend to consumers and small businesses. AFSA appreciates the opportunity to provide testimony to the members of the subcommittee. Today I'll focus my testimony on the role that the Federal Trade Commission has played and continues to play in restore, help, helping to restore confidence in the financial services industry. I will also address the installment loan industry importance in providing access to credit to millions of Americans. The FTC as the effective regulator. The FTC has been very successful in enhancing consumer protection under its current authority. It has addressed the economic crisis in two ways. First, by using its enforcement authority under Section 5 of the FTC Act to pursue bad actors in the subprime mortgage industry. And second, by setting federal policy through guidance and public comment. I'll start providing some examples that fall into the first category. The FTC successfully negotiated a $40 million settlement with Select Portfolio Services in November 2003 for engaging in unfair and deceptive practices in servicing subprime mortgage loans. The settlement was modified in August 2007 to provide additional protection to borrowers, including mandatory monthly mortgage statements, a five-year prohibition on marketing optional products such as home warranties and refunds for foreclosure, for foreclosure attorney's fees for the services that were not actually performed. The FTC has entered into a $65 million settlement with First Alliance Mortgage Company for making deceptive subprime mortgage loans. FTC distributed $65 million to nearly 20,000 affected borrowers. The FTC has successfully pursued other subprime mortgage lenders engaged in what the Commission deemed to be inappropriate uh, conduct, including Capital City Mortgage Corporation and Quicken Loans. And now I want to just move on to the installment lending and its role in providing credit to consumers. At the outset, let me say that AFSA shares Congress' concern about predatory lending. We support the goal of protecting consumers from unfair, abusive, or deceptive lending and servicing practice while preserving access to responsible lenders. The installment lending industry was born in 1916 out of a need to provide credit to working men and women. The Russell Sage Foundation worked with the lenders to develop a set of principles by which they would abide in their lending activities. Lenders agreed to make the cost of their loans transparent so that borrowers understood the true cost of the loan. Loans would be, to be structured over a period of time, allowing a repayment schedule that was long enough to match the earning power of the borrower. Finally, the lender would price the loan based on the character of the borrower which was defined as a combination of borrowers' employment stability and previous history of handling credit. Today, installment lenders are a key element in improving the socioeconomic status of poorer citizens and supporting our, our country's economy's health. They do this by adhering to a basic principle of, of economics, that people should borrow so they can consume based on the permanent income, and that such consumption is the fuel of our economy. Typically, the middle and upper class borrowers borrow through additional banking and financial services relationships. However, average wage earners with few financial assets cannot borrow in this way. 
Traditional banks simply are not equipped to offer products and services to these consumers in a manner that is profitable for the enterprise. As a result, these consumers need access to safe forms of small sum credit. These are the very products the installment loan industry, an industry fully and completely regulated and examined at the state level, have been providing successfully for decades. Certainly people turn to installment lenders for multiple reasons. Key among these, however, is the need to access small sums to deal with unforeseen circumstances. I can go on many of but if there are any questions, I'm welcome to take Thank you. Thank you. I certainly want to thank the panel for their excellent testimony. Uh, the chair now recognizes himself for a round of questions for five minutes. Uh, and I want to address my first question to the entire panel. And each one of you can take uh, a few seconds to answer the question as you will. Uh, most of you have testified this morning that the FC, FTC has not done enough to address consumer credit issues over the past years, particularly over the last eight years. And uh, let me just ask each one of you, do you believe that this is, uh, has occurred because of lack of action uh, that's either political or structural in nature? In other words, do you believe the commission have, has failed to act because of a simple lack of will or because of some underlying obstacles such as uh, the lack of statutory authority, the lack of resources, uh, burdensome procedures, or all of the above. I mean, what do you, if you can explain to you, to me uh, and your answers, why you believe the FTC has failed to act? Mr. Attorney. Well, we, could, we can go in the same order, Congressman. Um, I think it is clear that the leadership of the Federal Trade Commission at the very highest level in the last eight years, the very highest level, um, shared the deregulatory philosophy which was predominant at the time. Mm. And the philosophy was clearly stated to state attorneys general on a regular basis that you are officious intermeddlers, you are denying credit to people who need it. You are uh, applying the wrong standards that we should let the marketplace prevail and it will be a self-regulatory procedure. Mm -hmm. And although time and again, attorneys general would expressly predict, if turned out conservatively, a million home foreclosures, they were characterized as alarmist. Not necessarily by the Federal Trade Commission, but by the, by the tone of the times and by the interest groups that surrounded the commission. So the commission at the top reflected the reality. I also make another smaller point, that our past two presidents have consisted in naming people to the commissioners with an antitrust background, not a consumer protection background. And that's a bipartisan characterization of our past uh, three presidents, actually, mm -hmm. and that it would be a really good idea if the Federal Trade Commission had someone on the commission who had a consumer protection background and, secondly, actually had worked with the states and did not come from a large law firm or from the Hill. And I don't mean a personal characterization, but I really do believe that the FTC is lacking that kind of background and experience at the very highest level. Mm -hmm. uh, the other panel want to weigh in on this? Is I I do. Uh, I'd like to say that in the past uh, uh, 12 years, it's been primarily a political uh, or lack of willpower issue. Uh, uh, but going forward, it's more likely to have something to do with the structural issues. I mean, I, I, think, that, I think that there are structural problems, but even if, if 12 years ago we had cleared out all those structural problems, they still wouldn't have done anything. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, going forward, I think they're going to try and do some things now, and it's going to be harder for them to do it than it should be because of the structural barriers, uh, and it would probably help if we cleared some of those out. But even still, uh, I, I think we're still talking about tinkering with things. We're not talking about the magnitude of change that needs to happen in order to help facilitate more efficient and effective commerce. Mr. I, I would concur with my fellow panelists. I mean, I think a lot of it was ideolo ideological. I think there was this notion that self-regulation would work and the FTC should not interfere in the commerce of credit. Um, so I think that's part of it, without a doubt. And, and, that, and in part, that's why a lot of 
consumer advocates did not engage with the FTC and the AGs didn't engage with the FTC because we feared that the work we, do, we did would actually be undercut by, some of the, some, by their philosophy. I do think that resources are a significant problem there. They do not have, they have an awful lot of jurisdiction. They have very limited resources. They have very little rulemaking. And I also agree that if they had that authority over the last uh, decade, nothing would have changed. But I think going forward, we have some opportunity to do something. Yeah, Mr. Uh, Mr. Benson, I have 30 seconds, so please. Yes. Well, um, you know, we felt that through those cases that they have done things about, that's affected you know, close over 10,000 people. And when they pick on an entity in an industry, that has helped clear up everyone that's tied to that industry. So it's not just that entity that's been affected, mm -hmm. it's everyone in that environment that gets cleaned up pretty quick. So we think they have been pretty effective when they've picked on one entity, it goes through to the whole industry doing the same things. So we think so far they have been effective. Thank you very much. The Chair uh, now recognizes the ranking member, Mr. Rodonovich, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Benson, welcome to the subcommittee. I appreciate your testimony. I want to start off with you on a couple of questions. Do you believe the FTC needs APA procedures in order to be effective, or can it use the existing authority that it has to effectively regulate the industry? We believe that it can use its existing authority that it has. Let me ask you, how can regulation be used to reduce fraud without adding unnecessary compliance costs that are inevitably passed on to the consumer? Well, most of our members through AFSA have uh, are state regulated, so we, we are controlled mm -hmm. by that. Mm -hmm. We are in favor of disclosure with all our members, um, so we work with those people. So we believe with fuller disclosure, um, and with obviously the regulations we have the state, we believe that um, fraud will come out, you know, as long as it's monitored. Mm -hmm. I was looking at the, 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 the new sample disclosure form by the FTC, which I thought was kind of interesting. Can you tell me your opinion of it? It seems it's easy to read. I, have you seen it? So, no, we haven't seen it. Okay, okay. Uh, you know, my first glance at it is, uh, is, is something that looks kind of positive. I mean, I, I was curious to know what your thoughts would be on it if... Sorry? Yeah, you know, as, as I said earlier, our view is the more disclosure and the simpler it gets, the a lot better it is. Okay. Um, one last question. Are the FTC's proposed disclosure simplification forms for mortgage? Uh, I think you've already answered that one. Thank you, Mr. Benson. I, I appreciate that. Mr. Reingold, can I ask you, um, you testified that the FTC, um, that had the FTC the will to act actively engage in oversight, much of the current credit crisis could have been avoided. But, um, you know, we're talking about increasing authority through, uh, through the APA, and we're discussing that additional authority. I isn't that kind of a duplicative, you know, a uh, contrary statement? Or? I don't think so. I actually think, I mean, there are two things happening here. I think the F I, and I think, to be fair, the FTC was not the controlling regulatory agency here. The OCC right. and the OTS really failed, and mm -hmm. they had a lot of things that they could have done to prevent the disaster that we have today. I think the OCC, through its enforcement powers, if they in fact had been effective enforcers and, and using those decisions, I, I think the perfect example of what a strong enforcement agency can do is what the Massachusetts AG did in the Fremont case, where they brought a case against the mortgage company company who was engaged in unfair practices, where they were making loans that people could not afford. And using the unfairness authority, that court declared that these practices, A, B, C, and D, making a loan at a teaser rate that explodes and people can't afford it is unfair. Making a loan to people over 50 percent of their gross income is per se unfair. If the FTC would have taken some of those actions, even in their Fairbanks case, there was an opportunity to declare certain practices that the service in the industry does as unfair. It could have had a real impact on the type of practices that exist throughout the mortgage industry. Using that example, where was, uh, where was the problem then? Was it in the lack of, uh, was it in the application of Magnus and Moss or was it? Well, no, I'm talking about their enforcement power. I okay. mean, there's a difference between rulemaking. I mean, there, there are a couple of ways that they can set the, set the, set the law. Mm -hmm. By bringing in, if the FTC brings an action and gets a court order that declares as part of their court agreed order that this practice is unfair, 
that will have a pretty large impact in terms of the rest of the industry because it will send a clear signal that this is an unfair practice and hopefully would stop it. That's one way they can do it, through their court enforcement procedures. Mm -hmm. I think the easier thing they could have done if they, in fact, had normal, everyday, regular uh, 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 authority to make rulemaking is they could have done that without having to bring court cases. And the fact is, as a, someone who's been a veteran of dealing with a lot of the rulemaking that's done through, through all sorts of regulatory agencies, industry and consumer groups have ample opportunity through the APA procedure to get their voices heard and influence that process. And the notion that they need six to eight years with this lengthy, um, excuse me, but cockamamie system of, of uh, developing a way of, um, of rulemaking, really, it just, it's counterproductive and useless. And anything that they could do with the current system that we have in place, if it takes six to eight years, by the time you get a decision, um, the problems out there would have evolved to something completely different. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Rangel. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Chair Knight, I recognize the gentlelady from Ohio, Ms. Sutton, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we've heard repeatedly here today about some of the shortcomings of, of, of what we're um, trying to accomplish in the process that we now exist. Um, a couple of those, of course, revolve around the fact that the FTC, we hear over and over again, doesn't have the authority over banks that it has over other uh, entities. And we also hear about um, the rulemaking uh, uh, process being too cumbersome. Um, but I guess the question, one of the questions for this committee and for the Congress and for all of us here is, if the FTC had rulemaking authority that was more streamlined, the APA rulemaking authority, and they had greater authority over, uh, over the banks, and they had resources to do the job, is it better for the FTC to be the, the, um, the agency that deals with this, or some of you have suggested there should be a new, uh, a, a new um, entity that do so? If you could just answer those questions for me, I'd appreciate your opinion. Uh, I guess I would say, Congresswoman, I'm, like many of us, we're studying the uh, proposal by Professor Warren. It's been codified in the so-called durbin Delahunt bill. I'm not taking position on it yet, but it has a lot to do it. But I'm, if, I, if, if I may, to go back to your earlier point about payday lending and reminder of the song, if you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with. We have enough authority now between the states and the trial lawyers and the legislatures and the Federal Trade Commission. If we just want to do something and focus on a problem such as payday, take the resources we have, set a national strategic goal, and just go do it. And my concern about discussion of the larger institution is that while we play that huge congressional effort that goes on for so long that we've got millions of people suffering every day and we should do something right now. You know, I believe that the way you regulate it is, and, and I'm the only, I think, the only business person here, is to, you've got to have some skin in the game. You've got to have some money in the game. So. If you're going to securitize, you've got to have some, someone's got to hold a portion of the securitization on the books. Um, if you're going to have loans out there, you've got to have the risk factor that you shouldn't be able to go and draw on someone's bank account. You should be able to analyze the person's credit, make the loan that they can afford over time, payments over time, equal payments. That, will, that would solve the problem rather than the risk factor. When you've got nothing at risk, the issues, the issues come out. If I could, um, I, I think that uh, uh, a new agency is the way to go. Um, that's my honest opinion. It, it, the second choice would be the Federal Trade Commission. I don't think you should give it to the Federal Reserve Board. They've demonstrated that they're bankers at their heart and soul, uh, and, and they had the authority to pass why just they had they have extensive authority under the 1994 homeownership and equity protection act you passed that statute and gave them all the power that they needed and they did nothing the federal reserve board could have stopped this easily with their rulemaking authority under hopa and they didn't do anything uh, so what's to think that that's going to change now um, and what's more with the federal reserve board they have so much political uh, autonomy i mean it's so hard to um, exercise oversight over them because of their ju you know, justified and needed monetary policy independence. 
Uh, I just don't think that it's a, a good political entity that's going to be at the beck and call of Congress and will be responsive to the people. It's time for a new consumer finance regulator that deals with these types of questions. And if you can't get that passed, the Federal Trade Commission is the next best choice. But the, the problem is that the FTC has a lot of other important stuff to do. It needs to be out there on the antitrust uh, watchdog beat. It needs to be dealing with privacy issues, telemarketing issues, all very important issues and, and, and then very different than the consumer finance problem that we're talking about now. Um, this is, and this, if this is ever going to happen, it's now. And if you don't do it now, it'll never happen and we'll continue to suffer from these systemic problems for the next 50 to 100 years. I agree. Is that an I agree, Mr. Rangel? That would be an I absolutely agree. Okay, thank you. And I yield back. Uh, the Chair, thanks, me. Witnesses, we don't intend to go into a second round of questions. I think that we have uh, been well served by both panels today, and the chair really, again, uh, we are most grateful to this panel for the extensive use of your time, and we want to commend you and uh, on your patience with us as we uh, do this particular issue. I just want to note that all witnesses should be prepared to receive and answer uh, written questions from members of this subcommittee. And with that, uh, thank you very much. And Mr. Chairman, sorry, could I, could I ask that my complete statement be included in the record? Uh, so ordered, thank without you. objection. And I would like to request unanimous consent to enter into the record a statement from uh, the organization public citizen without objection, so ordered. This subcommittee now stands adjourned.